Globally, 4 billion people live in cities. Over 80% in the United States are considered urban dwellers right now, and cities across the globe are where most of the increase in population will occur over the next 25 years, with nearly 70% of the 9.6 billion people in the world living in cities by the year 2050. So urban agriculture is going to be very important. They're already growing food on porches, windowsills, and rooftops in many cities around the world, growing food as efficiently as possible. It's great to see this. You can't grow a cow up there on that roof. In the future, we'll be hearing more and more about these topics, all part of the better meat movement. And that's why we're going to review a little of this today. It's, it's going to be very important as, as time moves on. These are all part of the better meat movement, which simply impedes our evolution toward plant-based systems. What exactly does that mean, better meat? Basically, for those who argue this point, and there are many scientists who argue this point with me, better meat means that you can eat all the meat you want, but it should be humane, have more human health benefits, and better for our environment than regular meat. But there's one significant problem with this argument. There is no meat that is more humane, more, has more health, human health benefits, and is better for our environment than whole plant-based foods. So in reality, there, there isn't any argument. But as it goes, we're going to be seeing this, so let's review it for a moment. I found that this concept of better meat falls into two categories who argue it. The first category of better meat is grass-fed, pastured, humane-raised beef, chicken, pork, turkey, whatever animal you want to put in there, fish and aquaculture settings. And the second category is meat created in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. You're going to be seeing this. And looking at the first category, all grass-fed Pastured animals are in many ways more unsustainable than factory farmed animals, so that's not better, is it? Grass-fed meat is still unhealthy for human consumption as compared to plant-based foods, and grass-fed meat is produced from animals that are still slaughtered. And by any stretch of the imagination, that's not humane. So the only people who think this is better meat in terms of the grass-fed movement are those who are blinded by producing it or eating it, and they just don't want to see the truth. Now, regarding the second category, which is meat produced in the laboratory, once at $330,000 per single patty in just three years ago in 2013, now it's about $5,000 per burger patty. I had the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with the CEOs of the two leading companies in this, in this laboratory meat market, and there are a couple things that are very clear. Although meat produced in the lab has some, but not all the humane aspects worked out. For instance, they still use fetal bovine serum for their medium, for their solutions. And they have some of the environmental aspects that will be improved. But both companies who are leading this movement stated that they're about 10 years away from public launch. And from an environmental standpoint, as we saw even yesterday, we don't have 10 years. And from a human health standpoint, well, laboratory meat is sketchy at best. For example, both companies couldn't answer my questions about human health because their laboratory meat, as of now, will still have all the components that degrade our own human health as regular meat, such as cholesterol, saturated fat, lack of fiber, lack of phytonutrients, lack of antioxidants, lack of anti-inflammatory agents, no anti-cancer, anti-angiogenic substances, and laboratory meat will still have all the inflammatory stressors that come along with the meat that we're eating now, such as creating increased acidity, which you do not want, increased levels of C-reactive protein, arachidonic acid. All meat has, laboratory or not, will have higher levels of methionine, sulfur, acid-promoting amino acids, which promote Alzheimer diseases as well as others, dementia. They all have endotoxins. Laboratory meat will also still have all the cancer-causing agents when cooked, such as heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, etc. So no, there's nothing better about better meat produced in the laboratory, especially when compared to plant-based foods that take you in the opposite direction by preventing all these diseases. Again, there is no argument. Well, then, of course, we have to deal with this. More than five million people have seen this original TED Talk, and many organizations are now using it as justification for furthering the livestock industry at the detriment of our planet. This is going on behind the scenes. If you don't know who this is, it's Alan Savory. And since we don't have another two or three hours to expound on this topic, I can offer you these sources to bolster your understanding about this argument. I've covered this quite well in my second book, Food Choice and Sustainability. This savory TED Talk, then, is one idea that's, that's not worth 
not worth spreading. Alan Savory's methods have been proven not to work, but it's what 99% of the global population want to hear. How can we still keep eating meat? And the line of argument is becoming the latest buzz. He calls it holistic management, but essentially it's another term for grass-fed or pastured livestock systems, just like all the others that you see on this list. And you'll be seeing this being translated into products in the grocery store and on the news. All of this equates to continued loss of natural resources, suboptimal human health, and unnecessary slaughtering when any animal is entered into the equation. The report by Paul Hawkins, a uh, revered scientist, author at Berkeley, this, this report is called Drawdown, and it's going to be released later this year. You're going to hear about this on 60 Minutes in the Today Show pretty soon. It's, it's very limited in scope, and it repeats all the, what the rest of these methods are saying, that we need to eat animals and that hooved animals, such as domesticated cows, are necessary for human survival because there's no other way for healthy soil and production of food and us to coexist. Well, this is one of the many panels that I've been involved with in the last year or two regarding this specific topic. And I, I was involved in this at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, whereby all the participants that you see here, except for this guy right here on the far left, <laughs> every participant there were arguing that ruminants, such as cows and their hooves, are necessary for grasslands to exist. And the earth is covered by 30% grasslands. And it's the only way to remedy desertified areas, areas that have no, they're basically deserts that have lost all their topsoil, and that we will all perish if these systems aren't in place, basically stating that factory farms are harmful, which, which they are, and that we need to continue eating meat of all types, but especially from cows by turning all of our farmland and damaged soils into grazing pastures. That'll save us. Well, it's too bad that these scientists and livestock advocates are overlooking the fact that there are many examples in the world, many, many examples in the world that have been ravaged by livestock over the years, areas that have been deforested and topsoil lost because of grazing livestock. And now, many of these areas are flourishing with wildlife and plants without the influence of any, any cattle or any hooved animals. The theory that livestock are necessary or rebu for rebuilding soil or for our existence is completely erroneous. One perfect example of this is with this guy. In 1980, Ernst Gutsch moved from Germany to an area of destroyed rainforest of a little over a thousand acres in Brazil. It was called the dry wasteland by local tribes. The, the land was ruined because it was originally ancient tropical rainforest, maybe up to 50 million years old, all cut down because pigs and cattle were raised on it and crops to feed them. This is very typical of most of the areas in, in the Amazon that we talked about yesterday. Then erosion occurred, and then all the topsoil was lost and nothing could grow on it. It was basically a desert. It was dry wasteland. Well, Ernst be began his form of agroforestry here by planting seeds of indigenous crops, such as bananas, cocoa, and within 30 years, the rainforest had been rebuilt. It came back. It looks like this now. Notice that you don't see any hooved animals. You don't see livestock. 17 streams and rivers returned. The climate cooled with cycling, recycling of rainwater. Species of animals and plants returned, and again, this was this was without hooved animals. Proving that this reforestation and rebuilding, to go just one last step further, proving that this rebuilding of topsoil can be done in other climates other than tropical rainforests, here's another perfect example of an area that had been more than 90% of its topsoil lost. I'm going to circle an area for you to take a look at above the tree line where nothing could grow. And most of the plants and animals were either exterminated or displaced. A decision was made to simply put this land to rest. No livestock at all. It wasn't touched, just allowed to heal on its own, and a remarkable evolution began immediately when livestock and conventional row crop farming were removed from the picture. This is the way it looks today. So notice this amazing transformation, and especially the area that I circle here, which is the same area where nothing could grow. And this amazing transformation continued over the next 36 years on this, on this wonderful farm. Natural pasture and woodlands returned, species of insects, birds, and other animals reappeared. Pollinators became plentiful when they once were non-existent. Non this is the way it looks today. It's an amazing story of regeneration without the need for livestock. And by the way, I had the opportunity to verify all this as being accurate and follow the story along quite carefully every day since 1979 because you know what? This is our property. It's our rescue and sanctuary back in Michigan. This is where my lovely wife 
Jill and I live, so I know it's true. They can't fool me. So in summary fashion, meat that's produced from grass-fed, pastured, grazing livestock systems is actually less sustainable than conventional grain-fed factory farm meat, which of course is less sustainable than plants for us to eat. 